you just missed a fantastic intro. I was witty, <laughs> and charming, but this will have to do. Ladies and gentlemen, Ned Coletti, former G, uh, GM of the Los Angeles Dodgers, and our good friend and our first guest. On the drill. Thanks for being here. Hey, Ned. thanks for having me over here. This is Steve Lowry. That's Tom mm-hmm. Hofarth, and there's a cast of millions now Yes. here, and we'll get to everybody later, but we want to get right to Ned. Ned, uh, a month ago, we, like every other sports show in Los Angeles and probably in America, did our The Dodgers Are Dead show. Here we are. Really? Month. Yes. <laughs> here we are. It, I'll it admit didn't look it. good. I'll admit it. Now, a month later, second place. Three games out of first in a very winnable division, where it seems like maybe what, 88 wins could probably take that. May. Yeah. yeah we'll see. Uh, someone you helped develop, Matt Kemp, has been very instrumental. Are you at all surprised by Kemp, by the Dodgers, any of it? Um, first off, you know those that you know have panic in the streets. It's a baseball season, not a baseball month. <laughs> and you got so much to do, so many different things that are going to come and go. Uh, 2013, I think we were 12 games under 500 and nine and a half out of first. Yeah. Like end of June almost. Oh. Yeah. Ended up winning 92 games, I think, and um, went into the division by 11. So you know, there's so many different things that are going to happen. The, the blessing and the curse of the sport is that you play it every day. Yeah. And so you're going to get evaluated every day. And yeah. if you get – you know, five days where you're not pitching or you're not hitting or you're getting beat, suddenly you may never win another game, even though you got another 140 to go, right? <laughs> right, yeah. So, you know, I, I get it. But, again, it's a, I think they're the best team in the division. Mm-hmm. I think they're the only team capable of running away with the division. Yeah. And I think that those teams that are in and around them, above them today, I think uh, they better keep winning because this team, when it does get healthy, especially their pitching staff, It'll be a really rugged team to, to handle. Their offense has been great. Speaking of their pitching staff, uh, I follow you on Twitter. You really like Walker Bueller. Oh, yeah. What do you like about I him? I think Walker Bueller's got a chance to be one of the better young pitchers in the game. He's got uh, he's got a great mind for a young man. Got good stuff. I tell you, high fastball, it rides. He's got a good low, uh, heavy fastball in the upper 90s. Great curveball, great slider. He knows how to pitch. He's got great intellect to him. Mm-hmm. It's one thing to be able to throw hard. We can go out and find a lot of people to throw hard. To be able to pitch at that age with less than really 100 professional innings mm-hmm. before he came to the show this year, I love this kid. This kid has got a chance to be not just a big league pitcher, but really one of the top-end guys. Well, on the telecast, they often compared him to Hershiser just because structurally and physically he has this resemblance. Yep. But mm-hmm. is there any sort of... Resemblance, uh, maybe not oral, but is there any other picture he would sort of remind you of at this point? Well, it's hard to say. I don't know. The, the Hershiser one is a good one, although Hershiser did not throw right. that hard. Right. Uh, Hershiser has a tremendous mind for the sport. Right. You know, maybe uh, it's tough. Uh, I don't know if I really want to go, you know, Pedro Martinez or somebody mm-hmm. like that. Kind of a shorter bodied guy, but, you know, got that right handed whip arm type thing, delivery. You know, too early for me to say he reminds me of, okay. but I can just say that th- this guy is good. He is, he's actually, when I, if this is going to follow the comparison, I guess, K- Kershaw, Hall of Famer on the mm. way, right? Right. If you look at Kershaw's first five or six starts in the big leagues, whatever Walker Bueller's managed to accumulate this year, yeah, Kershaw's nowhere near where Walker Bueller mm. is. What do you think about the Kershaw situation this year? I mean, is it kind of a week-to-week basis and... Yeah, you got to take it. You got to, you know, the okay. medical staff and, and Kershaw and, and Dave Roberts and front office, obviously, you know, more than anybody. And I think it's it's when it's become a a recurring issue, the yeah. back has become a recurring issue. Uh, you got to get it. You got to get it fixed. You know, you got to at some point in time because you can't do anything if your back's hurt. Right. You, you can't do the show if your back's hurt, really. But it's, you know, it's something that continues to show. And he's somebody that works hard to alleviate it. Right. But you're looking at right now, it's it's almost uh, halfway through June, and you've got one start since the first day of May. So, yeah. you know, you got a little bit of a length there that's a little bit open on both sides. Let me put you in an uncomfortable situation. You're the GM of the Dodgers. The Lakers were in this position with Kobe. You got a guy who is now getting hurt more and more, and it appears that. While he's still an exceptional pitcher, his days as the pitcher in the league might be over. He's got, a, I believe he has an option for next year that I'm assuming he's going to exercise. But now, let's say next year he has a good year. Let's say he goes 16-9. and nine. 
and now he's coming up to be signed. The Lakers, in a way, rewarded Kobe for past uh, performance, right? As a GM, do you believe in doing that with someone like Kershaw, or are you only going to sign him for what you think he'll be able to bring to the team in the I think, future? I think it's a very tough question. First of all, he does have two years to go after oh, two. this year. Okay. Um, so you'll, you'll know more. You'll yeah. know a lot more when you get down to that day. And I think there's, there's deadlines, there's trading deadlines, there's contract negotiation deadlines, there's different things that come up that are based upon a schedule. Right. And I think in my case, I always used as much information as possible and every day yeah. if I could to, before you have to make a decision because you're going to learn a lot more about him, about everybody, about the market, all sorts of things. The information you have today is is a lot. Mm. Information you're going to have in another 700 days is even going to be greater, deeper, more. So I think you take all the information and you, you make the best decision you can. He has a decision to make, yeah, too. This right. is an all-on-one team. You know, it's it's he's got a decision to make as well. Ned, is your decisions you make as a GM, are they always completely based in the game? Or I want to tell the young kids out there in the early 80s, there was a Dodger player named Steve Garvey, who you might not believe this, what was as popular here as Magic Johnson was. And the Dodgers decided to let him go for a guy named Greg Brock that they thought was the next great thing, and it didn't yeah. work out. It really hurt the Dodger brand, as we'll say now, when they let Steve Garvey go. Um, Enough to where he went to San Diego and had his number retired there and still has not had his number retired as a Dodger. That's right. <laughs> yep. With a player like Kershaw or, so, or some of the great players that you've handled, does that ever enter into your mind, stuff away, that it, how it looks – for a team that I think the Lakers purely thought it just would not look good if we let Kobe Bryant go. Would that ever enter into your thinking? A little bit. I think that um, if it's real, I think it should come on both sides too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think if a player has the same feeling that a city and organization has where it's reciprocal, uh, then you think about it. Yeah. You, you have to, um, I think you have to take it into consideration, but I, I don't think you can allow it to, to drastically change the ability of your team to compete. Yeah. Well, That's you talk about that in in your book, The Big Chair, which you are in the big chair today, thanks to the show's arrangement. Um, some of the things that you talk about in there is your decision-making process, which is, is very it's so complicated that you probably, I, I have not read more a thorough book about how the how your thought process is in a lot of these things. Um but but the interesting thing in the book to me was the process by which you were hired by Frank McCourt. This this thing he put you through in a hotel by turning up the heat and these long uh, this way to evaluate you under stress under a stressful situation. I don't think you can do that with a player in the same way, right? No. You, you, no. So how do you sort of process what you, what what are the, uh, the the red flags that come up with a player that you're trying to evaluate? You, as you've done scouting and all that stuff too. Um, do you have sort of a process that you can go through to say, like, this guy I think is going to perform in a great situation. This guy maybe is not. Um, I mean, I remember conversations we had long ago with Matt Kemp. He came up at a very young age, had to mature a lot. Um, the player that you had to trade once uh, to Seattle, the, the uh, I'm blanking on his name, that, that caused a lot of problems in Dodger Town. Uh, the young player uh, went to Seattle. Do you remember? I, I'll, I'll think of it. Uh, some other Richard time. Sherman? No, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> sports. <laughs> wrong town, wrong sport. <laughs> yeah. But again, what? So what? What kind of do you have? Sort of a process that you check off boxes that you can sort of decide that this is a worthy of a, a long term agreement. Where there is uh, this is like a free agent type player. Uh, either right? that or a, a guy you want to bring up, a guy you want to yeah make a trade for. Well, it, the information is king, and, and it's just not. It's there's a lot of information that's analytical which you certainly look at. It, uh, it, it helps you figure out where a trend is, where a, um, an ability is, where a certain weakness could be. Uh, to me, that was certainly always part of the mix, but I really needed to know who, who's inside the uniform. Yeah. And, you know, you talk to people and you have to, you know, scouting is inter interesting, but you think that you scout, you just scout a game. You don't just scout a game. Yeah, I, I had to scout the scouts because some scouts are going to evaluate differently than others. Right. Some are more pitching oriented. Some are more hitter oriented. 
Some are always going to say yes. Some are always going to say no. Yeah. So you have to know how people evaluate, how people think. Uh, you have to know um, people give you a, um, you know, an evaluation on a player from a conversation. They may be with a different team. They may have been a teammate. They may have been have some relation that they can they can espouse upon a, about who how they know this person. You got to know how they think. Yeah. Because not everybody thinks the same. Not everybody right. evaluates the same. So the definition of the terms has got to be really clear cut. Yeah. And I would do as much as I could to get that information. The people I would talk to would not necessarily be on the top of uh, the list for, for many, but I would talk to many times the visiting clubhouse people if it was a National League player because they see this player come and go all the time. Right. Mm. And they see, you know, they see how he interacts with the manager, see how he interacts with the coaches, see right. how he is with his teammates, see how he is with the uh, the bat boys. So you got spies in the locker rooms. Well, not spies, but it's just a curiosity. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, you know this guy. Oh, I've known him for yeah. 15 how years. How did he Great treat guy. you, right? Yeah, how yeah. does he how does he react when they yeah. get beat? Right. Does he care? Yeah. Does he go right to his phone and start texting and showering and get out of there in, a, in right. 2 minutes? Or does does defeat the agitate him does it sit with him does he does he hate to lose speaking of that you got out i think just before social media really became a thing with with players where i think we had a thing with uh, uh, uh antonio brown of the steelers and they're having a meeting and he's joking around and and now players have this kind of personal relationship with their guys if you came back with that driving nuts are you comfortable with that? Well, we had it, you know. I have maybe not to the extent that it is now. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm on Twitter and I'm on the gram. Right. So is that what it's called the gram. He's hip. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Hip. That's what I call it. What do you wow. What do you call it? You don't call I, it the gram. I MySpace. Studio <laughs> audience, you call it the gram. MySpace. The gram? No. Yeah. Okay. Well, I call <laughs> it the gram. Kendrick calls it the gram. You should call it the gram. <laughs> I call it the gram. Jerry Harrison Jr., my buddy at Sportsnet LA, calls it the gram. Wow. So anyway, whatever I'm I on tele- Instagram, Telegram, or, Telegram, <laughs> and you know, but I'm in, you know, and it's a great, it's a great method of getting your yeah. story out. You know, yeah. if you're careful and you're wise with what sure. you use, yeah. you know, I've, uh, uh, I talk to young players all the time, amateur players, high school, college ones, and. I said, you know, when are you gonna? When are you scouted? And, well, when I want to get out, when I get off the bus at the at the stadium, uh, you know, they think that they're trying to add to it. And mm-hmm. I said, well, yeah, that's true. But you're also being scouted every minute. Yeah, every minute. You're always your, scouted. Every there's so many you're fingerprints always out there. Yeah, if you're on, if you're on Twitter and you're doing something, you know, crazy and you're not doing something you're not supposed to do, you know, people are gonna know that. Right. You're like you're like an open book. You can tell your story. You can tell a great story. You can give people more insight into you in a positive way. Right. Or you can have it take the other way. And we used to have, we did different things in spring training where we would show players, um, and we'd have somebody come in, a specialist, in it and tell them the value of it. And also the tough part of it, if yeah. you do something crazy out there, right? So we would show this film. We, th- we dimmed the lights. You'd have 50, 60 players in it. we dim the lights. And. And uh, they would start running this video, and it was all cell phone stuff or different things off of Twitter, and and uh, the players would laugh. It was other athletes from other teams, oh, okay. right? And they would just crack up at how stupid was that? Or, this guy's crazy, <laughs> and they just have a good time for right. a couple minutes. Then the last thirty seconds of the video was them, <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, the room went from hysterical to like deadly oh. quiet. Uh, said, so there you go, guys. Yeah. What do you want? What story would you like to tell? <laughs> I'm you know? just curious. Driving in here, I was listening to a show, and they were playing a clip from everyone's favorite, LeVar Ball. And uh, he was on some sports show on oh, Fox. Oh, I knew this was going to come Yeah? Up. Okay. So they said, uh, hey, uh, something about, uh, do you want the Lakers to sign your next son? He said, and he, they said, will you take your kid? Will Lonzo leave if you don't? He said, if they don't take all three of my boys, he is definitely leaving. And uh, because I want what's best for my boys. And uh, Shannon Sharp said, well, are you sure? Maybe uh, wouldn't you want to do what Lonzo wants to do? And he said, are you drunk? And um, <laughs> if you had to deal with something like that, how would you handle that? That would be a very tough one. <laughs> very tough one. Yeah, how do you weigh quality of player versus quality of family you versus, know. I mean, it's, it's yeah. like the Seeger family seems like a pretty stand-up tremendous brotherhood yeah so you, you got no problem with them does that factor um, in you i mean they say when you marry you don't marry the girl you marry the family is it the same thing when you're going to uh, go into business with a player uh, to some extent yeah yeah, yeah. you got to realize 
the outside influences and, and the possible distractions that, yeah. that a player is going to have. And but you also seem to have controlled Puig in some way with the distractions that you know he yeah. had. He seems to be a lot more centered, whether it's because of... Uh, I think Dave Roberts yeah. has done a tremendous yeah. job in the front office. And, yeah. and, um, and, and I, yes, yeah, I'll be coming a little bit more focused. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, great talent, but I yeah. think I think he's gotten better and better. I think last year was a last year, even though it didn't have the the um, the grandness, let's say, of his first year. Yeah, when nobody knew really who he was and just heard about him. Uh, the second half of thirteen, when he came up, I thought last year was his best year, and mm. I think this year he struggled a little bit. Went through the DL for ten days, came back, has been really good again. He's going to have a lapse on the bases like he did the other day where he got picked off. Mm -hmm. Have a lapse here and it's there. It's always going to happen. But yeah. he's, but he's, uh, I think he's a far different player, and I think it's Dave Roberts and the Dodgers have held him accountable, and have really let it be known. I mean, well, you sent him to the minor leagues him, for a while. Right, they sent yeah. him down. You know, that's that's a pretty good story right there. Yeah, that's a pretty yeah. good eye opener for yeah. you. And that that he stayed tough. He he got through it. He understood what he had yep. to do, and he came back and he was fine. We were talking about Matt Kemp earlier. LeBron James is playing his best basketball ever. He's in his early to mid thirties. Tom Brady is still getting the Super Bowl. Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal yep. are winning tennis tournaments. If you're a GM these days, has your clock changed? You know, maybe in the old days you were thinking 30, 31, we got to start watching this guy. Are we starting to push that clock now because athletes are in such better shape? I think you do a little while. I think when you go back to the uh, PED era, mm -hmm. uh, 36 was playing like 30. Yeah. So you had it. It was really a tough period of time to evaluate. Yeah. And and so the age, the, the clock was different, um, and you never knew when the buzzer was going to go off, and the, <laughs> and, the, and the player was not going to be, he was going to be yeah. thirty six or thirty seven like right. overnight. And I think that you know there is great athletes and there are great conditioning uh, situations where guys do work hard. I think in Matt Kemp's case, I think it meant a lot to him to come back. Yeah. Um, somebody that this organization drafted uh, before my time, and I had him in the minor leagues and developed him up here a little bit. And 39-40 um, guy one year, which is so hard to find, mm -hmm. combination of speed and power. Um, and we got, they traded him away after I left, and, and then he went to San Diego, and he went to Atlanta. And knowing Matt, I, I don't think it was a, a uh, easy thing to sit there last October and watch the Dodgers in the right. World Series. I think getting a chance to come back, I think he he's grateful for it. Played tremendous. All star. Yeah. All star right here, right now. So Tommy and I were talking about that. More than football and basketball, you can have a baseball player like Jake Arietta or um or Matt Kemp who goes somewhere else, doesn't quite work, and then, then is in another situation and it works. What is it about the baseball mind that the environment really does affect a, foot, a, a linebacker is a linebacker pretty much wherever you go. Yeah, him. that's a that's a great um, that's a great question. Uh, it could be the pace of season mm -hmm. because it is so many games. Um, you can't you can't fool any part of the season if yeah. you're not healthy. Yeah. If you're not a, a good teammate, um, if you got a lot of stuff off the field going down, if you got all kinds of different things, the season will expose it at some point. Yeah. And I think because of that, because it's such a constant, it, it's got a rhythm to it like no other sport. Right. It happens every day. You got uh, 21 days off over six months. You pay 162 games in 183 days. And in those 21 days, you're not away from your teammates. Right. Except for maybe two or three of them. Yeah. You are with each other every day. It's not like you're at work and so you got difficulty with the person in the office next year or cube next year. And you leave Friday, or you're, you know, in the 90-80 plan, and so you're yeah. off every other. So you got three days where you don't have to deal with the person, and then right. you come back on Monday and figure it out. Well, baseball's not like that. It, it, th those conflicts are never going away, right. so you're gonna have to fix them. And I think that when you get the the change of scenery deal, yeah. which is what you're talking about, sometimes that's that's for a lot of different reasons. What, can we just agree? I'm sorry, no, but I, this is a big pet peeve of mine. So can we agree? <laughs> but what you just said, how unique the baseball season is, how long it is, and how teams can go through. Uh, that great Dodger team yesterday had that, uh, uh, last year, had that stretch of like oh, 20 the, games yeah. where they were the worst team in, in baseball. Can we agree that baseball playoffs are the stupidest thing <laughs> 
Because well, the biggest crap. Well, shoot. this is what I'm saying, Ned. In in the NBA, what the best team wins 90 percent of the time. Fair to say, Golden State's going to win, right? In football, I'd say 70, 75 percent. Wouldn't you agree? In baseball, now last year's an aberration. Both best teams got to the World Series, but n- normally it's maybe a 50-50 shot that the best team actually wins the World Series. Well, I never really looked at it that way. I know that October is a very, very interesting month. Right. And baseball is at its apex when it's in October. Um, I don't know. I think it's. Um, I think it's the best. Yeah. I think Isn't the goal just to get into the playoffs? Because that is because you never know what's going to happen. Right. Exactly. Right. And you get yeah. hot, and you, and you get a break, and and, and it's always a weird d- dimension to me to see a roster built for the regular season yes. is so different than the playoffs. That great Seattle What other team. sport does that? Right. I mean, what other sport do you have to really change your roster? That's right. To prove right. that you're the champion when when in 162 games you didn't prove enough there. Right. I yeah. mean, it's almost like there's two championships that the World Series for as great as it is doesn't really prove who was the best team for the whole season. Correct. You sound like soccer fans right now. <laughs> I, was, I, I was just about to yeah. say I like you're like, oh, yes. let's get it. <laughs> it let's get the champions <laughs> president's cup <laughs> for the best <laughs> regular season and then yeah. you have a playoff. Uh, come well, on. Well, and I will agree with you on this. The, uh, playoff hockey and playoff baseball oh, yeah. is the most uh, – yeah. because at every, any moment every, it could change. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's because those are the only two playoff systems that we have in American sports right now where the underdog can actually yeah. win. Yes, yeah. it's where true. Where you can have an eight seed actually win or the four seed or the wild card or whatever or it the is. the NCAA but, tournament. But here's where that's different. different. I found it. But I, they never win. <laughs> no, no. They always – they're a good story for a week. Exactly. Then, yeah. Here's how that's changed. When I was a young man and I was the underdog, I wanted the underdog to win. Now that I'm the old guy, I want the tried and true. Every day you've been giving excellence, yeah. you should win. I want that reward. And you should call your father. <laughs> Those are the two things you should do. <laughs> well, what are some of the things in the book that we wanted to get into uh, – one of the things that we were talking about as a GM, and if we can divert a little bit here, you're a big hockey fan. Mm-hmm. I, you've told me once that if you didn't weren't the GM in a, a major league team, you'd love to be a GM for a hockey yeah. team. So what just happened with the Las Vegas Golden Knights seems to be like the most rewarding, ultimate thing a GM could ever do. You build a team, right. and in, in ridiculous way, it gets to the Stanley Cup final and, and had a pretty good shot at winning. Oh, yeah. um, is that sort of... Is that the Bob Beeman <laughs> was that of GM one of the, performance? Is anybody ever going to do this again kind of thing? It's um, boy, it may never happen again. Not in our lifetimes, perhaps. Yeah. Very well done. I mean, so well structured. They, they took advantage of other clubs um, making decisions on Gerard Gallant, for example, the, the coach. Uh, turned out to be a tremendous blessing for Vegas that uh, the Panthers decided he wasn't capable of leading that one. And uh, they drafted well. They drafted good people. They drafted championship-type people. They drafted people who were kind of maybe had a little chip on their shoulder mm. and maybe hadn't had the opportunity some other place. And I think they, um, boy, they did it. They did it from the beginning to end. And that's that's a hard sport to do that. Mm-hmm. In. Well, if you get Flurry available, that kind of helps you. Yeah. A lot. yeah. But, but again, Pittsburgh like... had let him mm-hmm. yeah, sit on let... the side. Yeah. You know, Murray but played the last couple I just cups. remember how the team was built, it was almost like right away they knew about drafting and trading, and they, they yeah. were making all kinds of moves. With t- They had all these arrangements with different teams right away. D- don't draft this guy, and we'll give you this guy. It's like, yeah. mm-hmm. it, was, it was very well done. Yeah. It was very well thought out. You know, they, they took they took a lot of players out of Florida, yeah. out of the mm-hmm. Panthers. Yeah. You know, Riley Smith and, and Marsha showed Mar- one of the best players in the team. Mm. The kid Carlson. 40, who's, who's 43 goals. Who's you know? the team you, you... you know what? I've, I follow hockey all the time. I, yeah. I, I don't um, I don't have a team. Mm. I have people. Okay. I root for people. I root for Rob Blake. I root for um, Dean Lombardi when he was here and mm. Dale Sutter. Um, San Jose, Doug Wilson's a dear friend, Brian Burke, who just left Calgary, one of my best friends in the sport, mm. one of my best friends in life. Uh, John McDonough and I worked together uh, at the Cubs. He now runs the Blackhawks as a president. Mm-hmm. Got people in Toronto. I've got probably people in about eight or nine different organizations that I root for. You right. Know? If they're playing against each other, I say, hey, you guys settle it. I'm just going to watch a game. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things yeah. that Steve and I were talking about, too, in the, with Cleveland, Paul DePodesta now running left baseball, now running yep. the Browns. Well, not anymore. No, no, no. Yeah. But, got, yeah. but, but in that situation, is there – some sort of crossover that do you you feel like you could take your baseball knowledge and sort of work it into a hockey? I think there's tremendous crossover. Mm. I spent a lot of time talking to these guys. They're buddies yeah. of mine, but we 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 chop it up all the time. Yeah, you know the, the playing surface is different. 
Yeah. And the salary cap or luxury tax situation is different, but the the challenges are so much yeah. the same. Yeah. Always. And so, you know, it's, it interests me a lot to, to really look into it and to, to know it as well as I can know it. When you talk to Ned, we were talking to him in our luxurious green room. Um, <laughs> he has a Sinatra-like entourage of lots of friends, and, and you really get a sense that when when someone's a GM and you're just a sports fan, <clears throat> that he he's a robot and he's yeah. he's dealing these things called players. He's just processing numbers. But and... of course, you're a human being. You're dealing with human beings. Sometimes you have to trade human beings or cut human beings. I was telling Tommy, when I was a young sports writer, I remember coming into Doug Rader's office, who was the manager of the Angels. Tears in his eyes, he had to say he was going to cut Mike Fetters. And he loved that kid. And it ended up Mike had a good career, but he felt horrible. How much, how horrible was that when you have to trade or oh, cut yeah. someone? You know, the moms and the dads and the kids. How hard is that to just shut that up? Or it, can it, you it shut was it up? It was never easy. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's all human. Yep. And people you know, put athletes on a, on a pedestal and, and a lot of different things, but everybody's human yeah and everybody's got a, a different personality to them and it, it was incumbent upon me to really know who everybody was yeah and to know how when i would get to that conversation how really best to do it yeah and if it was a player that i knew where it was going to go and where it might be in spring training and he might come in on a minor league contract might be a veteran guy and it might be the sun might be almost set right you know, I would I would drop it a little bit here and there so that it wouldn't be a surprise, a shock when we did have to sit down at the end. Yeah. But I had to, I've had to tell a lot of players that you know what, it's, it's time to go home. Was there a particularly tough one? Um, I can't think of one that was really tougher than the other. But yeah. I mean, some really good players because yeah. when you think about it, it may be the first time in their life. Mm -hmm. They've ever heard it. These are elite athletes. Yeah, yeah they yeah. might be 40 years old and they've been playing sports since yeah. they were five. Yeah. And playing baseball since they were five. And I was the best. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, they made it to the show and they mm -hmm. were good players in the show, maybe Hall of Famers in the show. Right. And then suddenly, hey, you know, you got to take it to the house. You got to go home. You take mm. them out for a beer. You sit them down in your office. I nah, mean, how in do you the start? office, in the manager's office. Okay. It was always a, it was a manager my, and myself to kind of lay it out. If it was a pitcher, sometimes we're kind of cutting in my Dodger days would, would be present for it. You know, you have the same thing at Dennis Spring Training many times where you're sending players out. Yeah. And, and that's always a tough one. Although most players kind of know. Um, but I used to tell them too, I said, look, I'm the messenger. No. But if you really look at the game and you really look at your performance, really yeah. without any uh, anything attached to it, I'm telling you, but the game has already told you. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You know, the game tells you how good you are. Yeah. You, you in fact, were involved in something. We were looking at a picture. Uh, Don Mattingly was your manager, and, and things weren't going great. Yep. And, and you, too, had one of the more awkward, <laughs> yes. awkward press oh, where yeah. you're sitting in basically different area codes. Yeah. And, you know, this happens every day in any American business where, where you've yeah. got, you know. but Typically you, not in public. Exactly. <laughs> you got the picture up there. There you go. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. What yeah. was going through your mind there? What, what, how were how you? Was your stomach just churning? No, I was saying, you know. I'm gonna let him go. I'm gonna let him talk. Right. And I was in the room. It was my little, it was very interesting. My my the little voice in my head says, "Just stay cool. Just stay cool. <laughs> Otherwise, a thousand years from now, they won't be showing a picture. They'll be showing the entire interview. <laughs> this way, they'll show a picture, but they won't have any more. I I, I didn't let it out. You right. Know? And uh, I understood his frustration. You know, we had just gone through uh, an ownership change, and, right. and I was looking for security and all that, and I got it. You know, I told him, you know, I talked to Donnie all the time. And, yeah. And he knew where I stood on sure. it. Sure, sure, sure. And, you know, it was just going to be one of those things. You're going to have to be a little patient with it, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah. And, you know? again, you have a high performer, a guy who was, oh, uh, I yeah. think, should be in the Hall of Fame. And, yeah. And, and yeah. yeah. I love Don Manning. Yeah. i tell you what. When you look at the draft he was drafted in, first mm -hmm. of all, he played in Evansville, Indiana. Mm -hmm. Weather, not necessarily conducive to playing spring baseball. Yeah. By the time of season, your season, your weather gets good, you're really almost starting football. And if you look at the draft, I think I think um, Dan Marino and John Elway were both picked in the baseball draft right. ahead of Don Mattingly. Oh, yeah. 
And there's Don Mattingly. Yeah. He got his number retired in Monument Park. Right. A great Yankee. Great guy. I mean, it was always an honor to, to be in his company, as it right. was with Joe, who came before Donnie. And um, it was never lost on me how, how special it is that, that this guy uh, did what he did. You don't, you don't do that without a lot of hard work. That's and it was part almost, of the reason I hired him. It, with the, in the, that, about the hiring of Don, it almost was assumed he was going to be the manager when Joe came with him. I mean, was there any sort of guys that you thought about that, you know, this was sort of in place for you? It, did, did you have any other thoughts about could if could you divert from that plan at some well, here, point? Well, here's here's the uh, here's the story. When I hired Joe, I said, "How long do you want to do this?" And he says, "Probably three more years." I said, "Okay, we, how do you feel about having your successor on your staff?" And he says, "I'm all for it." I said, "Good, because I need continuity. Oh. Yeah. I don't want to have to reinvent your culture, reinvent how you think and right. what you do right. every three years. It, it it doesn't work well." And so. He said, um, I'd like you to think about two coaches. And I always let, I always had a very diplomatic way of building a coaching staff. Yeah. I would give the manager names. He would give me names. He would come back to me and tell me who he wanted on the staff. Yeah. I always had to write a refusal. Yeah. But I, it was never like sometimes you'll hear a staff has got, well, that's the GM's guy. Right. Down there, or this right. is, you know, he's connected to this. It was never that. The manager okayed everybody. I okayed everybody. Yeah. That way we, everybody was responsible for everybody. And I think that's the most effective way of doing it. And in Joe's case, he says, I like to have two guys that, that you think about. One is Larry Boa, who I knew very well from my Cub days. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the other was Don Manningly. And I also found that it's it's far better to know as many people as possible right. before you have to ask about them. I knew about Don Manningly before I ever had Joe Torre tell me that mm. he wanted him as one of his coaches. Right. I was in a good friend of mine, Billy Connors, who was a pitching coach with the Yankees when, when Don Mattingly played. Right. Dallas Green, my first boss, managed Don Mattingly. So I would go visit with these guys, and you know, they would start talking about what a performer this guy was, what a hard worker he was, what a good teammate he was, and how he was just so diligent to be as great as he could be. Then I go to San Francisco. Our pitching coach is Dave Brigetti, right? teammate of his. Right. And we'd be watching a game, and he'd go, Donnie, boy, Donnie, really, this, this. I mean, all positive stuff. So when Joe says this, it's not like i got to start calling people now yeah. to find out You're about the Don Mattingly. Yeah. And so I knew that the work ethic was going to be off the chart, and, and it was. And so we hire other coaches, but we start with Donnie and, and Larry. And as it goes on, I'm thinking about – Donnie as a, as a potential yeah. manager wasn't told to do it. Right. It wasn't predestined okay. three years, two years, one year earlier. It, it was what it was. And then teams started to call me to get permission to talk to Don. That makes to sense. Manage. Yeah. yeah. And I knew that Joe's term was coming to an end. I offered Joe one more year and he, he, he declined. He was, he wanted to do something else, which he's been working at MLB ever since. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, I had a young manager who hadn't managed before except in the fall league. I had a young manager who I knew, who I trusted, who I knew was going to work really hard, who was never going to you know, be um, short on effort and then fail because of it. Mm -hmm. And and we also, you know, we're in a, candidly, we're in a place in time financially where we we're going to have to lower what we were paying mm -hmm. for somebody to manage a team. And that was... That was also a fairly big piece of it. So did I think of other people? Sure. But were they going to have the continuity aspect of it? No. Were they going to be willing to work for what we were willing to pay? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Yeah. And, and, I, and I trusted the guy that, that got the job. And for five years, he was over 500 every year, went to the playoffs yeah. a bunch of times. Yeah. You know. Tommy, we almost got to let uh, Ned go. No, we don't. Yes, we do. Um, I did want to ask you, yeah. you mentioned you worked in San Francisco. This is a question L.A. fans always have, this rivalry between yeah. the two cities. L.A. fans seem to kind of enjoy it. San Francisco fans seem kind of a bloodlust. Why, why do you think there's so much more hostility coming from San Francisco in this little rivalry of ours? I don't know. Maybe the weather. <laughs> a little chilly up there. It was a great spot. Boy, I, I am so blessed to have worked in them both. Right. Yeah. You know, I've spent 11 years there. I'm on 13 or 14 here. And I never thought I'd live in California, let alone live on the West right. Coast and be here for almost 25 years. 
uh, great franchises. A lot of friends on both, you know. But uh, you're right. It's it's a little bit, it's a little bit sharper up there. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, bit, yeah. A little bit meaner up there. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, they're you jealous. Know, competition is good. Well. The beaches in San Francisco don't have a whole lot of people. <laughs> well, they're they're sharper, different. too. They're a little sharp. <laughs> Let's do a little quick uh, five-minute kind of closer with this, kind okay. of like actor studio, you know, where they get these quick questions. Because yeah. I want to involve these guys, too. First question, who you got in the World Cup? There's no Italy, no United States, no Chile, no Netherlands. Not that any of those would matter, but I think Italy – you got to be disappointed. Well, very disappointed. Uh, <laughs> like, why even watch? Again, <laughs> you know? Ned is but, in this uh, book featured baseball Italian style. If you want to pick this one up later, you know, I I, I really haven't been paying attention to yeah. who the better teams are. Is it Brazil? Somebody like uh, that? I you don't, don't have to go with the better team. You could you could pick. Uh, what, well, you can. Uh, I need a little bit more insight. Mm. Who's uh, who's the best what, team? Who you guys got? Uh, isn't it you, you can talk about all the teams and then just Germany wins? Isn't that? Okay? I'm Germany. It's in my blood. I gotta go yeah. Germany. I, I say uh, Brazil. We were talking with it with Eric's roommate, who's the much bigger soccer fan yeah. than any of us, and uh, he said he is big on France right now. Okay, mm. but I, I don't know enough. France seems to be kind of the San Jose Sharks of the World Cup. They're always coming big. And <laughs> They've then they won a couple, unlike less. the Sharks. Yeah. Yeah, the Capitals just won. I, that's true. That's Schmied, true. you're there. There he is. Yeah, Schmied, who do you got in the World Cup? <laughs> My last name's Abear, so I'll take France. Uh. All right. You know who I'm picking? Or not picking, but I'm rooting for? Argentina. I'd like to see Messi get his one. Oh. I'd like to see Messi get his one. And if not that, Belgium. All right. I like De Bruyne. Second Very question. Uh, what's your favorite curse word? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you. Yeah. You're allowed. You're allowed. You guys yeah. can guess it. You guys can probably buy the book. You'll see it in the book. It's oh, in there the you book go. A few times. Do you do it with your hands too? Do you... I can do it any way I need to. <laughs> any way to get the point across. Right. I'm passionate. I don't like swearing. It's passionate that yeah, there creates you go. that. Uh, other question. Um, Favorite Father's Day moment. Father's Day's coming up, and I, I, I want to recommend, again, Ned's book as a Father's Day gift. Any great Father's Day moment you have. Now, I, I'll preface this by knowing you could be with your dad, but I know you and your son have a tattoo that's matching tattoos. Yeah, I do have um, I do have two tattoos, and people were, are, like, taking aback that I've done that. You know? <laughs> but uh, I read this, this great book um, by Tim Russett. Uh, worked for NBC, Meet mm-hmm. the Press, and um, since passed away, and he talked about him and his dad and what what great you know what a great guy his dad was buffalo new york and then he tells a story about his son luke yeah and luke comes home from college and uh, he's trying a shirt on at christmas time and his shirt rides up a little bit and the mom sees a tattoo and you know freaks you know and he says you know calm down let, let me tell you about it and so he shows his mom and dad he has his dad's initials on his Aww. side and he says, I just always want you by my side. So I'm sitting in Pittsburgh, you know, it's like 2 in the morning, <laughs> you know, just had a game, watched more baseball than I can handle for the day, reading this. And I, I started tearing up, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, man, that's wild. So I called my son, and I said, hey, I got a question for you. I said, it's probably, uh, if I told you I had a question for you, you could probably write down a 1,000 questions that I might <laughs> ask you. you this. But you're not going to think this is coming. So yeah. if you want to take a day or so to think about it. You know, and I he said, "What's up?" I said, um, "I'm gonna get a tattoo of my dad's initials on his side, on my side, and uh, I would be honored if you would do the same thing." Oh. And he says, "Really?" And I said, "You got it." And he goes, "You're right. Never did I think my dad would be <laughs> asking me to get a tattoo." So we went to a place. He came in, and, and he can't just show up and do it. I think you got to make an appointment. So we had an appointment like two months out. My well, son just was just like the the Dodger tattoo guy. Yes. Yeah. And there's a famous fan. True who's a, Blue. Yeah, True, True Blue, Blue yeah. Tattoo. Yeah. And he had a shop on oh, Sunset yeah. Boulevard. Yeah. He used yeah. to give them out for free, the little L.A. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to really make it special. Right. And I, I just don't, and my, my dad, God bless him, has been gone for a long time at that point in time. So I'm trying to remember his signature. Uh-huh. Oh. Because I just don't want NLC, which are his initials. Right. I want him, like, really kind of a cool way of doing it. So my mom was alive, and my mom had mild dementia. And so I would call her, and I'd say, hey, you know, you got anything Dad wrote on? You know, check or this or that, you know. Yeah, I'll look, and then, you know, she couldn't remember. And so I'm, I'm kind of going on my own. And I'm didn't, I am didn't. remember this so vividly. I'm going on a Monday morning at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Sun flies in. We're going to drive down to Sunset and get this done. <laughs> and I'm cleaning out a closet where I live, and 
years ago they would have it would take like movies home movies right and it'd be on a reel right right oh, sure and but they but the way they do it you didn't it took them to a movie house or a place to develop them a place that just developed film right they you have you fill out a little card that they would put on top of the envelope, right. self-addressed stamped envelope. So when they were done processing it, they could mail it back to you. Right. Okay. So I'm cleaning out this closet at 10 oh. o'clock at night. I'm thinking, you know, tattoo tomorrow, I'll have to recreate my dad's signature. And this box falls out of the top of the closet. <laughs> oh, I, swear, I swear to God. I swear. And there's 20 of them in there. Oh. All of my dad had filled out. That's Ned awesome. Ned Coletti. And his name, his signature, and the address of our house. And I thought, this is wild. So I take it in, and, and the guy carves it in, carves it in, in his N, in his mm. L, and in his C on my left side. So Dodgers are playing the Cubs. I go back into Chicago to see my mom, and I say, hey, mom, look what I got. And, and she freaks like, you know, <laughs> you like, like bring Luke, your mom out. That's Luke great. Russett's mom did, <laughs> right. you know. And... Um, no, You're I, never gonna I be said, able to get a job with that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. You know, I was 50 years old. You know, but uh, so I said, I need you to write your name on the back of my business card, so I'll have this. So, so one day, you know, when when I, you're not no longer <clears throat> here. I have your initial on my oh, right that's side. Fantastic. And and she says, "What?" I yeah. said, "Please do it." I, ha I actually have it in my money clip, the card. It's never right. without me. Yeah. And I have my mom's initials in her handwriting. On my right side. I find it interesting that your dad's initials were NLC because that's National League champion. Too. <laughs> How about that? How about that? That's right. That should that's be the right. walk-off story of this that's show, a, huh? Yeah, that's so, got to be. Oh, yeah. There is and one other little okay. story to it, and I, I didn't have a chance to really to tie it all together. But it, it's how things happen in my world sometimes that, that just blow me away. I'm a, I'm a sinner like everybody, but also a very spiritual guy. So I teach school at Pepperdine University. That's right. Mm -hmm. A year ago, I also taught a grad level class at the University of San Francisco in Orange County. Okay. Right down 405 by Children's Hospital. Mm. So teaching that class, and the students say, hey, would you come to our graduation? I said, you know what? You get me a ticket. I'll fly up there to, to, you at, to San Francisco, and I'll, I'll go to your graduation. So it all happens. I'm sitting there by myself watching the graduation, probably 15 students getting their master's degree. Beautiful cathedral up up in the northern part of the city there, and they always give a, a letter, a, a degree, a, a doctorate degree, and and letters or honor or something right. like that, right, mm -hmm. to somebody. So I'm sitting there, and uh, this person gets introduced, and uh, they start talking, and my mind's kind of wandering around, and then I hear her say, "When my husband Tim Russett died," and I thought, "This is the mom of Luke, oh. who's in the book." who, without that story in the book, I don't have the tattoos. Wow. I had, and, and there she is, like, in front of me. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. <laughs> but as it is, it's a procession, people leaving, you know, it's a little bit of a chaotic scene with, you know, all, all the graduates right. coming out of there. And this, So I couldn't get out fast enough to find her and to tell her. But that story influenced influenced. Was she wondering why this man was raising her his shirt? <laughs> she would have been hey, had, I, had I ran into her. I, I probably would have just said hello first. But, but I thought that was kind of a, a kind of a cool little little that's, vignette. Uh, that, I, I'm going to call my son today, and I think we're going to uh, that. That's just great. Yeah, that's it was, just it was awesome. very very cool. Hey, we want to thank Ned for being here. He's very busy. Hold very up the book demand. again. We got the book on the screen and really read it. And uh, seriously, this is we were talking out there. There's a lot more, so we're hoping Ned will come back sometimes. Right. This has been terrific. Thanks for watching the drill. Follow us on uh, Twitter and Facebook. When I know what's your Twitter? Real Ned Gram. Real Ned. Real Ned Clay. And on the gram. The gram. The gram. And the gram. Gram. He's got the gram. That's right. We yeah. Farther off the wall. We're gonna have a website. The Drill LA was gonna be coming up soon. So yeah. Uh, we'll have everything in a consolidated place, and we'll see videos and the history and the archives of what we've been doing. So. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ned. Thank, Thank you, you for Ned. having me here. Right. That's great. It. Great conversation. See you later. Thanks, Ned. Thanks. Cool. Way to go.